How much does it suck for me to follow Jeremy? Jeez. <laughs> Seriously. I actually, uh, I met him in, um, at a conference in Bogota, and, uh, and he pre, uh, preceded me there too. And thank God that half the audience didn't know how to speak English because uh, I, I, you know, I, I sucked after that, and I probably suck today. Thanks, dude. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is uh, my Max, and um, I sent in this this power uh, this presentation. Um, I think it was on Monday, and I'm originally from Chicago. I live in Boulder now, uh, Colorado. So I had like I had um, I had this slide. Oops. <laughs> and I was and I was gonna say I was gonna be like, can't we all get along? You know, we we can. And then like I, I landed last night, and I asked uh, I asked a, a friend of mine like, who won that series? You know, like Chicago, I'm like, oh, how do I get that slide out? Um, but anyway, I'm not here to really talk about uh, hockey and these guys. Uh, I'm, talk, I'm gonna talk about these guys. Um, this is uh, the four leaders of the so-called BRIC countries, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, and it was, uh, BRIC was a, a, a term that was coined by a Goldman Sachs chief economist, Jim O'Neill, uh, who said that by 2050, these four countries would overtake North America and Europe as, uh, in, in GDP and growth. Um, he also predicted that by um, 2010, these four countries, Brazil, Russia, and India, China, would account for 10% of the world's GD, uh, GDP. Uh, currently, in, 20, uh, in 2010, they're at about 15%. So they're already eclipsing his prediction. Uh, so by 2050, it's safe to say that these four countries will be kind of the next superpowers, so to speak, um, when it comes to, to GDP growth and, and, and activity, economic activity. But I'm not here to talk about these guys. I'm, I'm more about talking about these guys. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a group of people in India, obviously, if, if you think of Pakistan. Um, because instead of paying attention to the leaders, I want to pay attention to the, to the people that live in these countries. Uh, because we need to pay attention to them uh, from a marketing perspective, not just from, from economic growth, but what is it and what are companies doing um, in order to reach them. Uh, as a creative director, um, it's my job to come up with new ideas. And, um, and I decided to go around the world. Um, instead of Instead of coming up with ideas in North America or talking to my colleagues, I decided, why don't I travel to these so-called Brazil, Russia, India, and China, these so-called BRIC countries, and see what's going on, going on there. Uh, because I figured that if, uh, if I can find lessons there, um, maybe I can bring them back here, um, help me do my job better, help me come up with better, uh, better creative ideas and programs for my clients. Um, and it's interesting to point out that um, we have to kind of see the, the global perspective. We get a little bit caught up in our North American mindset or our North American or European mindset. Um, but if you took 100 people, if the world was made up of 100 people, you know, 57 would be from Asia, 21 would be European, eight would be African, five would be North American. 12 out of those 100 people would speak Mandarin Chinese. Um, 70 are non-Christian, 30 are Christian, six possess 59% of the world's wealth. Uh, 70 are unable to read, and only one out of 100 actually owns a computer. So we have to kind of put that into, our pers into perspective, and I hope you have that in the perspective as I go through some of these, um, some of these uh, case studies and some of these examples. But it's even more interesting, and what we should really uh, think about is that the majority of the world is really poor. Right? We kind of forget that as marketers. Um, there's about 4 billion people uh, that live on less than $2 a day. Four billion people live on less than $2 a day, right? And so I decided, like, well, if you're getting $2 a day, how are you spending your money? How are marketers trying to, to, to reach you to take 50 cents or a dollar off that, off that $2? Um, and what I found is globally, especially in the BRIC countries, consumers are extremely brand atheistic, extremely price conscious. Um, and are really looking less for features and benefits from the products that are being marketed to them, but are looking for experiences, um, looking for something more than just product, really looking for aspiration. And I figured, you know, why is that important for us? Well, the reason is because we, as North Americans and Europeans, are becoming more brand atheistic. Uh, we are definitely becoming more price conscious. And we're starting to exhibit tendencies that the, the consumers in Brazil, Russia, and India, are, in China, are as well. Uh, we are becoming poorer, so to speak. Sure, we, it's, we're still super 
wealthy. Six percent of the world, uh, six people out of 100 own 59 percent of the world's wealth. But we are becoming much more price sensitive, much more brand atheistic. So that's why I, I kind of started traveling around and talking to people and, 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 and wrote the book. Um, but I found four kind of main themes that is coming up or bubbling up from the global consumer mindset. Experience, authenticity, big thinking, goodness. So let's go through experience first. Um, there are more uh, poor people in India than anywhere else in the world. There's about 450 to 500 million people in India that live below the poverty line, right? But that's not really the, the, the story. The real story is that there's an emerging middle class that's coming up from this poverty, and they're basically leaving the farm and coming to Mumbai, to Calcutta, to New Delhi. Um, there's about 300 million middle, uh, Indians that are joining the middle class, um, and I think that number is going, to, uh, is going to double in the next 10 years. So there's this consumer class of people, right, that are leaving the bonds or leaving the shackles of poverty and entering the middle class, and there's obviously a wide array of marketers that are trying to cater to them. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest kind of marketplaces in India right now is the, the mobile phone market. Um, the mobile phone for a typical Indian is now the fifth most important thing in their lives after food, shelter, uh, clothing, and education. Right? If you have a mobile phone, it kind of means you've made it, or you're on your way to making it uh, in India. Uh, so it was interesting once I kind of realized that, I was like, well, let's look at the mobile phone market. You know, um, in India, about six and a half million people sign up for phone service every month. Like, wouldn't you love to have six and a half million customers sign up for your services or products every month? It's pretty, it's pretty staggering in terms of the, the, the growth of the mobile uh, marketplace in, in India. Um, and right now, Bharti Airtel is, uh, is kind of the leading provider, but Nokia has got 75% market share in India. Um, and so I started looking at Nokia, like what is, what is Nokia doing in order to sell phones? Um, and it was very interesting to, to see that Nokia hardly ever does any kind of television or print advertising in India. What they do is they have these vans, right? And these vans go out into the countryside where there is no TV, there is no radio, where 500 to 600 million poor Indians are living. And they open up the doors to the vans and they start talking about the, the idea of a phone. They don't actually sell phones. They have to educate the marketplace of what a cell phone is, right? And it's really kind of becoming experiential at its, at its purest form. They give the phone to people and they start talking about it. But what I've found was it wasn't like how, it wasn't the fact that they were talking about it or, or the idea of a phone, it was how they were talking about the phone and how they were presenting the phone uh, to, to poor Indians in the countryside. And the way they do it is with skits, right? Song and dance, right? So they have this truck, this is an Airtel truck, which is a, which is a mobile a cell phone provider. Right? They have this, these trucks that open up and there's a little tiny stage and they do song, song and dance about the phone product and about the phone product uh, benefits and features. As a matter of fact, the way to market any product in India these days in the hinterland right, is with these trucks that open up as stages right? and you do skits and plays. And it's very Bollywood. I don't know if anyone ever seen like any Bollywood movies, but it's so over the top, you know, and it's like, uh, the phone becomes the hero of this Bollywood play. They'll recreate like a, like a little romance, and then the phone brings two people together and, and, the, and the crowd cheers, right? And, it's, and it's, it's, so, it's, it's so fun to watch. And what actually has happened is that um, TV commercials, right, are now played out in a live theater setting. So I have a colleague, his name is Bobby Power. He runs uh, Mudra DDB. Uh, it's a shop of about 750 people. And out of those 750 people, they do television ads, radio ads, print ads, whatever. Out of those 750 people, 300 of those, uh, of those employees are devoted to translating TV commercials into live plays that goes into the villages to, to kind of you know, create this experience.